Another Deruta plate of this type, made around 1460 to 75, deals amusingly with the theme of love's blindness. It shows an elegantly dressed young man in the latest court fashion, which enables a close dating for the plate by comparison with dated frescoes and paintings. He holds a scroll which reads in translation, the lover thinks that everyone else is blind, but really it is he who sees little. This ironic and popular motto presents the infatuated young man as a figure of fun, but may, be, may be derived from a contemporary print as yet unidentified. Much more sophisticated and disturbing is this dish in the Metropolitan, painted in Gubbio in 1522. The scene is set in a landscape and shows a heated argument between a well-dressed young couple. The woman holds a knife in her right hand. She points at her lover, whom she's tied to a tree. She appears to address him in her fury as she advances towards him. He looks away towards the viewer. A cartouche in the foreground is painted with the arms of a patron in the inscription, your infamy hurts me more than death. The interpretation of the scene remains mysterious. In some elements, it resembles that in the early Florentine engraving in the British Museum here, in which a woman has tied her lover to a tree and has just plucked his heart from his breast, signifying the cruelty and vulnerability of love. But the inscription adds layers of complexity. If it is the young man who's threatened at the hand of his lover, then it must be he who's speaking, in which case the infamy must be due to the woman. The scene and inscription might perhaps be based on a contemporary print, or yet to be identified, or possibly on a romance, as is sometimes suggested in the case of other representations of love arguments on my olica. The arms, which have been tentatively identified as those of Turamini of Siena, appear on two other lust of pieces in Cambridge and Paris, which are painted by the same painter and are dated 1522. From unrequited, we move to requited love. Erotic or sexually suggestive scenes are often portrayed on Maiolica, which was a popular medium with a wide social reach. Sensuality is wonderfully evoked in the dish I showed at the beginning, with the couple embracing in a landscape, and many of the belle donne are unequivocally sensuous in their representation of young, desirable women. This spouted drug, shark, drug jar is, however, sexually explicit, the body of the jar is painted all over with a repeating floral design. Beneath the spout is a roundel with a scene of an embracing couple. A young man and woman sit close to one another on low stools with their legs touching. She wears a coral necklace, a typical betrothal gift from a fiancé, as proven in list of betrothal gifts. The couple gaze into one another's eyes. The man embraces the woman with one hand round her neck and the other on her breast. Around them flutters a scroll with the inscription, I am the happiest man in the world. 1548. The jar suggests the kind of behavior expected of young couples to signify their betrothal, and it's painted in a naive, almost caricature-like manner. The contemporary sexually suggestive scene is in keeping with other Castelli wares. A dish in Washington is painted with a young woman holding a bare breast in one hand and a bird, long associated with Italian slang for the penis, in the other, accompanied by a scroll reading, take and don't regret it. The worst that can happen is that you would have to give it back. I'm sure you'll hear more about this this afternoon. Last but not least, with regard to myolica associated with love and marriage, are the sets of myolica made to commemorate childbirth, which were presented to a new mother to celebrate the birth of a child. These pieces often feature idealized but recognizably contemporary childbirth scenes or they show the healthy male infants, which were so strongly desired in Renaissance society. We know the function of these pieces because they're described in detail in a contemporary treatise on Maiolica, written around 1557 by Cipriano Picopasso. I show you here the relevant page of his treatise, showing birth wares and how to make and assemble them. And on the next screen, three pieces from a set in Detroit, which were made in Urbino around 1560 to 70. The three pieces are painted with delightfully intimate scenes of nursing and swaddling a newborn baby. Sometimes the scenes depicted are classical rather than contemporary. Two pieces from a set made in Faenza by Baldassare Manara around 1530 to 40 are painted with the classical legends, including Pyramus and Thisbe on the plate shown here. The outside of the bowl is painted with the arms of a married couple from the Viarini and Benini families of Faenza indicating that the set was a special commission for a particular birth, which would then have become a family heirloom. Other ceramics in the show can be directly linked with betrothal and marriage. 
Small spindle worlds made of ceramic are equally fascinating for what they have to tell us about love in marriage, ideals of domestic life, and a female virtue. I'm showing you on the left a group of Myolica worlds with women's names on them from the British Museum, and which were probably made in Deruta in the early 16th century. Spindle worlds were used to weigh down a distaff when spinning wool or flax. They were much used in contemporary society in a domestic context, and many are painted with the names of women to whom they were given as presents, often as dowry items at the point of marriage. Amongst the worlds here are ones inscribed beautiful Katerina and beautiful Cassandra, for instance, indicating their likely function as gifts for named individual women. Along with pins, needles, sewing baskets and thimbles, these worlds were commonly grouped as dowry items, almost as indications of a woman's domestic, virtuous role in her newly married state. The Myolica versions on the left are inexpensive and popular gifts, but the single world on the right is a courtly love token designed to display affection. It's made of one of the rarest types of Italian Renaissance ceramic, known as Medici porcelain. This was a type of soft paste porcelain made in imitation of the Chinese porcelain, which was highly valued and much collected at the Medici court in Florence. From the mid-1570s, Grand Duke Francesco Primo de' Medici worked with a team of specialist craftsmen at making this soft paste porcelain at his court. Around 70 pieces have survived, made from this highly expensive and experimental medium, which was used for court objects of day-to-day -day use, as well as for diplomatic presence. This spindle whirl, though it bears no name, must have been made as an elite love token within the ambit of the Medici court. It's well designed for use and shows signs of wear. And here I show you two rather blurred 16th century prints, which shows spinning as a virtuous activity for women, even well-born women. On the left is Hans Baldung Grien's woodcut of 1511, on the right, um, showing St. Elizabeth spinning with her female companions. And on the left is Luca Bertelli's print of around 1560, showing the ancient Roman matron, Lucretia, who is considered an exemplar of female chastity in marriage. She's shown working at her embroidery while a widow spins behind her. They're presented in a well-to-do domestic interior with a small child learning to walk in a baby walker at the left. Such scenes indicate the ways in which spinning and sewing were seen as feminine accomplishments and their accessories as emblems of female virtue. These associations are taken even further in the painted ceilings executed in 1560-1 by Giorgio Vasari in the apartments of Eleonora de' Medici in the Palazzo della Signoria in Florence. Vasari described how in one of the rooms we painted a large roundel in the middle of the ceiling with a story of Penelope dealing with her domestic business, weaving at her loom while her husband, Ulysses, is away at the Trojan War. Penelope is shown virtuously weaving as a chaste and noble activity, surrounded by her handmaidens sewing and spinning. The painting suggests the intellectual context within, wi within which such a mundane object as a spindle whirl could be viewed as a love token and become associated with a woman's status in marriage. I've taken you on a journey exploring the various ways in which Myolica paintings, painters use the imagery of desire and of love and the symbols of marriage on their wares during the Italian Renaissance. In the case of noble patrons, I've looked at the heraldry of married couples and of widows. I've also examined inscriptions which appear to link a ceramic to a particular woman for whom it was intended as a gift. When we move to popular imagery and design motifs, we should of course remember that their use may only reflect workshop practice, depending on what kinds of visual sources were available. Or they could integrate shrewd marketing instincts. You only have to go shopping with a young teenage girl to see that any accessory decorated with a heart always seems to appeal. But this imagery can take us a lot further than that in what it has to tell us about ideals of behavior and patterns of social interaction. I've stressed the social function of ceramics throughout my talk, and with good reason. Myolica as a whole bridges the archaeology, material culture, and art history of Renaissance Italy to a degree that no other art form can match. Echoes of great painting are everywhere on these ceramics, but the common inspiration is that of prints, through which the work of great painters was often mediated. Myolica therefore gives us a unique insight into what the Renaissance meant to Italians both inside and outside the scholarly and artistic elite. This is what makes it one of the most vivid and characteristic arts of the Italian Renaissance. Thank you.